The faith isn't hard to know. It's hard to do. Our text this morning is Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through verse 37. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this morning. We pray that you would help us to know your word and to do your word. We pray that you would give us wisdom according to it, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The 1987 film, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, was about two very different men who chance upon each other at LaGuardia Airport. They were both trying to get to Chicago, but end up annoying each other to a long chain of misfortunes that have them traveling on a trio of planes, trains, and automobiles. We're going somewhere, too, and we need a travel itinerary on how to live. This morning, in the Sermon on the Mount, we'll gain some clarity by looking at the trio of anger, sex, and lies. Anger, sex, and lies. So first of all, let's look at anger. Go ahead and open up your Bibles. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. Now, we're continuing here in the Sermon on the Mount, picking up where we left off last week. Remember, Jesus is sitting on a hill of some sort. He's got this large crowd of people in front of him. First and foremost, he's talking to the 12 apostles, and he's speaking to this larger group of people that are following after him. It's been set down in the Word of God. And so through the Bible, Jesus is also giving us instruction. He's showing what the law was all about. He's adding to their understanding of God's Word. And in verse 21, it says... You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to hell of fire. Now first of all, I want you to notice this is regarding close relations here. This is talking about your brother. Speaking about a fellow Jew, someone who's close to you and their relationship to you. And notice this is about anger and anger and murder. Why? Because anger leads to murder. Whoever is angry, unrighteous anger that's not based on reality, can have themselves led all the way down the path to physical murder. Now, is anger wrong? Kids, is anger wrong? Is it wrong to be angry? I think we get this idea in our pietistic view of the Christian faith that anger is always wrong, but anger is not always wrong. To be angry at sin is not wrong. To be angry at unrighteousness is not wrong. Psalm 4, verse 4 says, Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. The Apostle Paul picks up on the same psalm in Ephesians chapter 4 when he says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So anger is not wrong, nor is it necessarily sinful, but it is a highly charged emotion. And friends, the problem is our hearts are wicked. We don't see things the right way. Oftentimes, we think we're engaging in righteous anger, but in reality, we're engaging in sinful anger and sinful anger at the end of the day can lead to murder. Now notice the trajectory here. Everyone who is angry at his brother is liable to the judgment. The judgment was that. It was reserved here for the command, do not murder. Whoever insults his brother is liable to the council, to the Sanhedrin, to the leadership of Israel. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, is this saying that if you think someone's being doltish, Foolish? Is that what that's talking about? Someone acting like a clown? That's not what that's talking about here. The word there is raka. It's an Aramaic word. It really has the idea of being a hell-bound fool. Someone who needs to be looked down upon because of their poor spiritual condition. It's a posture of contempt. And in fact, this is what the leaders of Israel think of Jesus. He's a hell-bound fool. And he's leading all these fools astray into judgment. He's a misleader, a misleader of the people. And look what happens with their view of Jesus as the fool at the end of the day. Their anger burns against him. They hate him. 
They speak against him. They try to seize him. And at the end of the day, they have Jesus murdered. And so Jesus says, beware of anger. Check your anger. Test your anger. Whether it be righteous or sinful, more than likely, it's probably unrighteous. Going on to verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, have, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Notice this scenario here. The worshiper has come to engage in a religious duty and is at the altar with the priest. He's doing what's good and right. He's come to the altar and there as he's giving his offering, he's reminded that his offering really isn't anything. In reality, it's what God does with it. He's giving up his offering. He's reminded of how God has been merciful with him. How God's anger could burn at him and yet God is merciful and forgiving toward him. And he stops to ask the question, is someone angry at me? Now this has heightened language, so it requires wisdom in order to do this right. In fact, I remember when we were fundamentalists, we got way overboard on this. Somehow we got into this practice of when we'd have communion, I think we had communion maybe once a quarter, and we just stopped the service and people go out into the lobby and make phone calls and try to reconcile themselves with people. Friends, we do communion every week. That would be very disruptive. Don't do that. The point is keeping short accounts as you walk through this life. As you come in here week by week and you may be reminded that someone has something against you, then go and take care of that after the service. When you leave church, having engaged in religious duties and being reminded, like this Israelite was, of how much you've been forgiven of, have it as a rule for yourself to ask, is someone angry at me? And if there is somebody legitimately angry at you, go and be reconciled with that person. Verse 25. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with them to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you pay the last penny. Again, the context here, first century Israel bubbling over with anger, bubbling over with angry people, people who have legitimate responses to what's happened to them. They're being ruled over by oppressors in their own land, but they're so angry they want blood. They want the Romans out. They're waiting for that day when it's going to boil over into murder, and then they're going to kill a bunch of Gentiles. They can't stand those people who work with those Gentile authorities, like tax collectors. They want them dead. Sometimes they had them put to death. Anybody that has anything to do with the Romans and anyone who's not on their side with their anger against the Romans is suspect. Jesus says, make peace before it's too late. Make peace before it's too late. Look at what the anger of Israel does in the wake of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They put him to death. They won't believe in him. And then a whole bunch of Jews believe in coming to the church at Pentecost. And then they become the objects of anger and murder themselves under people like Saul of Tarsus. And their anger builds and builds and builds and they store weapons away and they start a war with Rome. And God brings judgment upon their heads. God brings judgment in the court of righteousness on their heads. And Jerusalem is wiped off the face of the earth. And the temple is brought down to nothing. And friends, the larger meta narrative is this humans are angry at God. Sometimes we're angry as Christians at God. God, why did you allow this thing to happen this way? Why am I being treated this way? Why do I have to go through this or that as though we have a right to question God? As though God has been merciful to us in not wiping out the human race after the fall, but allowing things to go along in time, giving us time to repent, bringing in multitudes into peace. Humans are angry at God. And the larger story is this. Make peace with God. Make peace with God. Judgment's coming. We're going to be brought before the court of God. And if we haven't believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, what excuse will we have? anger. Let's look at sex now. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. 
But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Do not commit adultery, says the word of God. Having sex with someone who is not your spouse. Now I want to say this. There's a difference between lusting in your heart, committing adultery in your heart, and engaging in the physical action of actual adultery with someone. But one dovetails into the other. But I don't think we should confuse the two and make them identical. In fact, every heterosexual male has fallen into this sin at some point in time. Now, that's not the downplay. But the point is, if you cultivate lust in your heart, if you cultivate adultery in your heart, it will eventually work its way out through your hands and your feet. You look on a woman, and you can appreciate her beauty, and there's nothing sinful about that. But notice, look on her with lustful intent, You've committed adultery in your heart. And we do that in various ways. We think maybe we're not doing that because, you know, I see a woman, I think, hey, she's beautiful, but I don't fall into lustful intent with that. But what are the other ways in which we fall into the sin? Well, it's hard to watch movies a lot of times. I like watching Netflix shows when I'm at the gym, and I don't know how many times these shows, which are supposed to be, you know, for 14-year-olds and older, show full nudity. you got to, like, turn it off. You can't watch the show anymore. Watching R-rated movies, willy-nilly. Pornography is endemic in our time. It's poured out upon us from every pore of our culture. Fantasizing about another. Lust of the heart paves the way for lust of the flesh. Verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better, better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now Jesus isn't telling you to physically pluck out your eye. Cut off your hand. People have done this in history. But why the heightened language like that? That should tell us something. That spiritually, you make war just as if you were to pluck out your own eye and cut off your hand. Mortification. Putting the old man to death. Making war on the flesh. You don't hear that much in the church these days, do you? You hear happy, clappy messages about how to live your best life now. How to have a great marriage. How to have happy kids. How about putting sin to death in our lives? How about making war on lust? Jesus did. Jesus made war all the time on sin. External sin. He was sinless. But he was always being tempted from the outside. He always overcame. He was always making war. And we, in him, by the power of the Spirit, should do the same. We should make war on lust in our own lives. Now notice this specific radical attitude here in the Sermon on the Mount. Revolving around sexual sin. Anger is dealt with by Jesus externally. Do you notice that? He says, go and go to the one who's angry at you and be reconciled to them. There's somebody out there. But sexual sin is radically internal. Your own hand. Your own eye. Put on the full armor of God. And make war with your own flesh. Verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, Jesus is not talking about every single option in the Bible regarding divorce. If you look at the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it does indicate that divorce could be engaged in for being abandoned, but Jesus is dealing with a specific major problem in Israel in the first century. Israel had a culture of easy fault divorce. And before we look down on them, we've got a culture of no fault divorce in America in the 21st century. So what is this talking about? In Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 1, it says this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, he has found some indecency in her. If you look at the older rabbinic tradition, they assume that indecency was something regarding sexual sin. 
and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house and she departs out of his house. She's now on her own. Now a woman in the first century can't just go and get a job someplace. Ordinarily, in order to survive, she needs to get remarried. In the first century, the idea of indecency being found in her eventually morphed into trifling things. Small things. In fact, tradition has it that burning a meal could be the reason for giving a certificate of divorce. And why would a guy do that? He put it off under some rubric, right? You're not serving the man in the house. You burned the meal. You're not doing this or that the way that I think. But why do you think you would actually do that? I think the answer is obvious, as it always is. He must have married somebody else. He's got lust in his heart. Jesus restores the grounds for this command, sexual immorality. A wife divorced under these insufficient grounds who remarries is forced into the unjust situation of being unrighteously remarried. She wasn't divorced properly. She's sent out. She has to get remarried in order to survive. She gets remarried, and now she's unrighteously remarried. John Calvin says, a man who unjustly and unlawfully abandons the wife whom God had given him is justly condemned for having prostituted his wife to others. So we see the text. Now let's look at lies. Kids, lies. Going into verse 33. Again, you've heard it that was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Now, vows are a good thing. In fact, if you look at the Bible, there's vows. There are good vows that are presented as a good thing. Our confession and our catechisms talk about good and proper vows. In fact, I think it's inescapable that you have to engage in vows of some sort at some point in your life. The patriarchs made vows. Nazarites make vows. Marriage has vows. Courts have vows. But vows should not be entered into lightly and should never be entered into falsely, for that is lying. Perform your vows and don't lie. Perform your vows, kids, and don't lie. Going on to verse 34. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath on your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. If you can help it, don't vow. If you can't fulfill your vow, it will be interpreted as a lie. Now, proper vows are rare and solemn and call on God as a witness, but Israel created a whole system of Western vows. Now, primarily in America, our culture is derived from Central and Northern Europe, in more subtle, less uh, emotional cultures, as it were. But when this is being said in Israel in the first century, we're talking about kind of hot blood and Mediterranean cultures. If you've grown up around Italians or you've got Italian blood in you or any of that sort of Mediterranean culture, you know that people love to swear on little things. You see this in the mafia movies, right? You know, it's like, yeah, we found out you're skimming money. I swear on my mother's eyes. <laughs> nah, nah, we got it on video. No, no, it's not. I swear on my father's dream. <laughs> so they have all these lesser vows here. Look at this. If you can take a vow, you're supposed to take it before God as God as your witness. But they've got by heaven, they've got by earth, they've got by Jerusalem. I'm sure they've got tons of other lesser vows to the point where when you have your Kol Nidre service on the Day of Atonement, even to this day, the first song that's sung is a very somber song asking God to forgive you for unfulfilled vows. But how about our system? Even though we look at our system and it'll be more Northern European and not having so many fleeting vows, but how about the system in which we live and we move and breathe? Billions of dollars of time wrapped up in insincere vows. Real estate contracts that are abridged that we never had any intent of fulfilling. Divorce courts in our land filled up with people with all the reasons of irreconcilable differences. Being sued by your neighbor because you didn't do what you said you were going to do. Friends, what if we as the people of God were people who fulfilled our vows 
didn't take vows that were unnecessary and were known for our honesty? What if people knew that Christians, when they shake your hand and they make a deal with you, their word is their bond? That would be one way we'd be marked out from the culture. That'd be one way we'd be a lot more like Jesus. We have a well-developed culture of lies. Verse 37, let what you say simply be yes or no. Kids, instead of making vows upon vows, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than this comes from evil. My friends, you have to take a vow when you get married. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. In fact, I encourage people all the time, and sometimes they don't listen to me as a pastor. I say, you know, when you get married, get married in the church. It's good for you to have the, the witness of the church and have the sense of God watching and blessing your ceremony and being able to recall that in times when they get hard because we are so weak and foolish, are we not? Anybody in this room that's been married for any length of time, you know there's times when you want to cut and run. You want to break that vow. I don't like my spouse. I don't like my husband. I don't like my wife right now. But you recall you made a vow. And you need to fulfill your vow. And then a couple weeks later, everything's cool, right? And you wonder, what was I thinking? But when you go to the Elvis Chapel, you know, someone that did that, Las Vegas, and got married by a replica of Elvis, you might look back on that and go, is that not real? Don't multiply it. Simple vows, trifling vows. But the ones you must engage in, take them deadly serious. You have to make a vow when you go to court and put your hand on the Bible and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You have to take a vow when you go in the military or if you become some sort of civil servant, like you become a member of the city council of Buda. You have to take a vow, take that vow seriously. And everything else, try to make your yes be yes and your no be no. Let your yes be yes and your no be no because Jesus took a vow and fulfilled it all the way to the cross for you. I knew a guy who was brilliant, perhaps too brilliant. His IQ was off the charts. And he hated school because he was poor. So he dropped out of high school and decided to join the Marine Corps. He went an open contract, which means he'd get whatever job the Marine Corps decided to give him. He took his oath of service, his vow to his country, and his contract, and he was trained to be a cook. He hated his job, getting up at 3 in the morning and peeling potatoes. He was a quitter and a liar. He hopped the fence one night, ran away, and went AWOL and added criminal to his list of accomplishments, including vow breaker and liar. Brethren, keep your vows, even to your own harm. For God honors discipline and sanctified living in an age of broken promises. As we've seen this morning in the Sermon on the Mount, anger, sex, and lies. So we give Gloria. For God, let me be Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your teaching. The teaching of your Son. The teaching of your Son which shows us how we are to live from the old covenant to the new. Bless us to be people of purity. Bless us to be people who put to death the flesh. Bless us to be people of our word in a crooked generation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.